Richard Lester and Hal Ashby, but also uh, the, the fiction of J.D. Salinger, um, music, I liked how he used music, and just sort of took apart the style of Wes Anderson to illuminate how you can take all of these things and make them into something that's your own. That was sort of the concept of it. And my editor, Eric Klopfer, uh, saw it and called me up and said, hey, uh, we're thinking, I, I would really like to publish a book about Wes Anderson, and we need somebody to write it, and I think you might be the guy based on this series, and would there be maybe some way to, to kind of adapt this series into a book? And that was an interesting challenge because the whole idea of doing it on video was that I didn't want to just do written criticism. I wanted to actually pull clips and put the graduates side by side with Rushmore and actually show you things. And, uh, but it was adaptable to book form. And it happened that Wes had seen the videos and liked them a lot, sent me a nice note about them. So I knew he was in a good frame of mind. And after some negotiation, he got him to sit for a long interview with me about the style. Um, so that's the sort of practical origin of it. But on a personal level, um, anybody who's read me knows that I am uh, an extremely uh, passionate critic about particular directors, like to the point where people would kind of wish I would just shut up about Terrence Malick, <laughs> and Wes Anderson, and Michael Mann, and, and uh, David Fincher, uh, Catherine Bigelow. There's a, a number of modern filmmakers, Wong Kar Wai, that I just think are great. Like they're as great as any directors who have ever worked in the medium. And some of them, the consensus has, has sort of uh, settled that people seem to agree with that. And in other cases, there's kind of a sense that the jury's still out. And for a long time, the jury has been out on Wes Anderson. And I think particularly it took a turn towards the negative with uh, The Life Aquatic and Third Chain Limited. I think there was a sense that maybe people were tired of him or they thought he was uh, doing too much of the same thing or not enough of something. But a big part of the reason for writing this book was I wanted to have this book that showed the depth of, of Wes's work and the complexity of it and all the layers of it so that you could look at the entire thing and go, okay, there's something that's going I like the way that, as you said, that you were able to translate the video essays into the book form as well, to place it in the context of film history and its influences as well, because it does work in a book form at the same time. Well, it was really important to me to do that because I think Wes is... I just think Wes is um, one of these directors because he's so visual and because for the most part he's concerned with giving people a hard time, but there's a tendency to think that his films don't have any depth, or that they're all pretty pictures and, and, and cool music and cute clothes and stuff. And, and uh, time after time we have seen an example after example of filmmakers who are fun, bright, exciting, interesting, and a little bit eccentric who don't get the credit they would do while they're alive. Or maybe they give them an Oscar when they're 95 years old and, and they have they show the painting of the statuette in a hospital and they're on the their face. And uh, uh, I, I, I would really hate to think that that happens with Wes, but if it does, he'll probably be fine with it. I, I'm sure he'll feel over at you know, age 103 in his director's chair. Um, but it would be nice if we appreciated it now. And, I, and there's a lot of directors that feel that way. And there really are deep, deeper themes in his films, I believe. You said, you, you said well, you know, of course he wants to get that. Entertain folks, but I mean, like there's themes in you know Royal Tenenbaums and like aquatic, you know, bringing people together in family units and in groups, and I think that, that kind of runs and it's in dark healing what is it as well of uh, reconnecting and uh, of broken relationships. I believe that are yeah. well, and, and he's also one of the most death haunted directors working today, and it's even true in this movie. This movie is, in fact, Wes said in the interview I did with him for the book that. Um, he did an early cut of the film and was not that much longer, it was only about eight minutes longer. And people who saw it said, oh my god, this movie is so sad. I thought you said this was a comedy. He said, it is a comedy. You know, but you know, it's about a kid, is, a kid lost his mother and there's a woman in it who lost her husband and there's this guy who's going through divorce, but it's a comedy. <laughs> and all he had to do was just sort of trim it a little bit and rearrange the parts and then people saw that yes, in fact, it was a comedy. But it's also a comedy haunted by death and it's also about extended mourning and, and people who are locked in this mode where they cannot stop working and they cannot move forward. And, and Bill Murray can't let go of his marriage, which apparently has been failing for quite some time before Max in the picture. Um, Miss Cross uh, is not ready to move on yet, and Max and her can help her do that eventually. And of course, Max, you know, when you look at why, why does Max need to be the master of everything, well, look at what happened to him. Because he lost his mother when he was seven years old. And the fact that the movie doesn't hit that too hard, that they're not constantly waving this grief in your face, is another reason this is a wonderful movie and basically a comedy. 
Well, and also, he did, I mean, Matt, Matt Smith's briefing is basically tied to Rushmore. He, he doesn't, I mean, him leaving Rushmore basically means he's finally going to have to move on. Right. And he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to do that. And, and having to go to, so he's, he's basically being forced to do that. And it takes him to resist him for a while until finally at the end he kind of starts to, I mean, he finally appears really young, young person, young adult. Good question. Uh, there's a standing mic right here, and Arlene has, has a, a, a roving mic if you want. Let's have an audience come on up. Hi. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, two, this is like a two part question and two different questions. Uh, the first one is if you could elaborate a little bit on the role that Owen Wilson played in the writing process. Because I know Wes Anderson gets all the credit as the auteur, but this, is, this was you know, a collaborative screenplay as far as the writing process goes. The second question, um, it, in, the, in the movie Rushmore, the scenes with uh, Serpico, the yeah. illusion of Serpico, and then the callers of love with like an illusion of platoon. You know, are these kind of like shout outs to Pacino and, and Oliver Stone and some of his, are they kind of like heroes of his, or is he poking fun at, at us as an audience, do you think? Oh, no, they're very much, they're very much celebrations. They're very much celebrations of the ones that they love and that they discovered in college. And in fact, uh, Wes said that um, when he became really good friends with Ellen Wilson at UT Austin, uh, it was more, although they had a lot of the same influences coming in common, a lot of it was a case of Owen uh, showing Wes American films from the 70s that he hadn't seen, and Wes showing Owen European art films from the 60s that Owen hadn't seen. And you put those two influences together, you get a lot of the Wes Anderson style. Um, but Owen Wilson, to describe the working process, this is not in the book, this is something he did sort of describe to me when the microphone was running, but I'll paraphrase. I said, what was your working relationship like with Owen? And he said, basically, I would sit at the keyboard and uh, Owen would pace around the room talking and throwing ideas out. And I would throw ideas to, to Owen, but Owen would, do, he, apparently Owen was the kind of guy who would just throw, I'd throw a million ideas, like this really profligate producer of ideas, and maybe one out of every 10 of them would, would work even remotely. And, and Wes's job was to catch that one and sort of find a place for it in the script and kind of egg him on. And that was kind of the relationship. And he said, I said, did, did Owen ever sit at the typewriter? And he said, once in a while when my hands got tired, he would open. Mostly he was the pacer. And I thought about that and I realized that um, most of the writing partnerships that I've had in my life, I've either been the guy pacing around the room dabbling incessantly, or I've been the guy sitting at the typewriter figuring out where things go. And that seems to... I can vouch for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think uh, this movie, interestingly, a bit of trivia, Bob Rocket, Rushmore, The Royal Ten Bombs, and The Life Aquatic were all concepts that Wes Anderson had sort of had beforehand and that Owen Wilson helped him flesh out. Um, and these were four ideas they had in college. And it was just purely by luck that he got to make his first four films as director. And they were the four stories that he had come up with in college. Usually it doesn't happen that way. Um, so the first movie that he had that was written, that was devised completely outside of the context of that early part of his life was The Dirt Show. And that one feels different. It does. It feels different. And for those who didn't, I mean, for those who didn't like the life of it, I think they did come back to Dark Healing, and, and particularly the short that we see in Dark Healing. That's, uh, no one ever talks about the short, but, you know, the joke I made, you know, he's got a new movie coming up, and it's his eighth feature. Uh, you probably should call it Wes Anderson's Eight and a Half, right. because uh, he has eight features and a short to his name. That's the, true. The, but the short of the hotel, Chevalier. 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 Yeah. And that is, I mean, people forget that. That is beautiful. That is a beautiful uh, kind of uh, prologue. Oh, I got this is half a quote, not that I really just had to say while I was watching this. I was thinking about all of the sort of foreshadowings and things that he would do in future films. But the aquatic fascination in this movie is very, very strong. And, and when you see, when Max sees that inscription, you hear the sound of. Uh, the water and the waves and seagulls calling, and that occurs again when he gives her the invitation. And of course, her her, her uh, husband was an oceanic explorer and died 
drowning, and that's something that happens in the water. It's all just, it's kind of amazing. Like, there's a, there's a, a I, I guess I would say a, an imaginative coherence to Wes Anderson's movies that, very, that has very few rivals. I think maybe the comments are up there in Tarantino and things like that, but uh, you can really see how that quote that Robert Altman gave when he got his Oscar, he said he felt like he was making one long movie for almost over the course of 25 years. I think that's sort of true for Wes Anderson. Yes, sir. I also have kind of a two-parter. One is a uh, comment, and um, the uh, one of my favorite books about movies is Cameron Crowe's Conversations with Wilder. Yeah. And so when I read about your book, I was kind of excited about the idea of a conversation slash homage at an uh, earlier stage in a person's career, uh, which you kind of mentioned. And I haven't seen the book, but, but uh, uh, I mean, from somebody whose work I've read, And the second part is um, his movies have a lot of sense of place and location. And as you mentioned with Bottle Rocket, it's maybe a little bit more identifiable as Texas because of some of the, uh, the motel and some of the uh, outside scenes. But uh, Rushmore, I hadn't put in Houston. It took me, the first time I saw it, it took me a while to realize it was Houston. The first time I saw uh, a scene on, uh, I think, North or South Boulevard where they're walking along the street. And then the view of Herman Park from the, I think, the Walter Hotel. Um, but was that an effort to kind of de textify the, uh, the setting to make it a little bit more universal? Or, as you said with Dallas, to make it more of a, an insider's, you know, you watch and say, okay, that's Houston. Not deliberately. And, and he talked about how in shooting at Rushmore, he shot that at his school. That school was the school where Wes Anderson went to school, and the public school is where his father went to school. And intriguingly, the public school is located directly across the street from the private school. And I'm, and I'm a little surprised that they didn't do the obvious sight gag and have him getting expelled from Rushmore. And he walks across the street and anyway, he goes to the public school. Um, but he said that while he was shooting at Rushmore, uh, he, uh, he knew exactly where every scene was going to take place. And it took him a while to figure out that the crew had not gone there. And so when he said, like, we're going to go set up the camera over by the garbage dump behind the gym, he's like, we don't know where that is, Wes. You're going to have to tell us. Um, so he had a very strong kind of sense of place. But the, one of the many intriguing, distinctive things about Wes Anderson is they have a very strong physical sense of place. And you know, the colors, the textures, the landscape, the air, the light, and everything is very, very palpable. And yet, he never tells you exactly where things are set. They're always set in this kind of imaginative like the universe of a Richard Scarry children's book or something like that. Like Bottle Rocket, they never say Dallas and Bottle Rocket, they never say Houston and Rushmore. The Royal Tenenbaums is set in New York City and they never say New York City. It feels, it feels like like an imaginary New York home. It is. It's too. It is. And, and in fact, there's this shot, I love the story, but Kum, the late great Kumar Palana, um, you know, who poor went out for Kumar, uh, he, he, there's a, a wonderful moment in Royal Tenenbaums, where he's having a conversation with Gene Hackman in Battery Park City in New York, and Kumar is blocking the Statue of Liberty. He's positioned so that he is directly blocking the Statue of Liberty, and supposedly when they lined up that shot, Gene Hackman said, wait a minute, you should move the camera a little bit this way or that way, because Kumar is blocking the Statue of Liberty, and Wes is like, I know. And apparently Hackman was furious about this, because he just thought it was so nonsensical and perverse to shoot the movie in New York City deliberately position someone to blow. It was almost like you were taunting the audience <laughs> like that, but uh, that's the way he rolls. Yes, go ahead. It's really that simple. He's a huge fan of Roald Dahl. He loved the Roald Dahl's fiction has a lot of the qualities of Wes Anderson, and it's very sprightly and cheerful and innocent. And yet, there's a dark and at times even sinister undercurrent to Roald Dahl, and, and so that was a big deal. And as far as the style being different, I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily say it's that different. I mean, he's working with puppets and miniature sets and forced perspective backdrops, so 
visually it's going to be a little different than the usual, but the types of shots that he uses are, uh, he often uses the same kind of shots in that film that he uses in the other ones. And I, and I, and I got a big kick out of that, frankly, because again, just like positioning Kumar Palana in order to block the Statue of Liberty, there's something a little bit perverse about doing an animated movie and not taking full advantage of what you can do in animation. When we watch a Pixar movie, a lot of times they'll start on a close up of a port and they'll pan back until you're at the edge of the galaxy. You can do that in animation. And for the most part, he doesn't do that in Fantastic Mr. Fox. He kind of treats it as if the little tiny stop motion puppets are real actors in the room and he can only do certain things with the camera. It's just, it's funny. It is, so, and it's also, it also, by the time you, when you get to Fantastic Mr. Fox, it's like, this is what he needs to do. He needed to do one of these animated films. It's like, it, it's, when you saw it, you're like, no, this is exactly what he can do with this. And I have to point out, because already the movie had a sense of animation quality to it. In Life Aquatic, it seems like a kind of a, almost like a run up to some of the framing. Uh, it does. To, to well, he's got Henry Selleck and Scott Machine yeah. doing these sea creatures that are not in any way meant to be thought of as real. Right. You know, like they're clearly they're clearly stop motion. Like, and they, even the way Bill Murray introduces them, he'll say like, "Oh look, the sugar crabs are out tonight," and he's looking down clearly out of camera at something that's not there. It's on. It's like part of the joke. Almost. Yes, sir. Talking about his um, trajectory, how do you guys perceive of his attention to directing? Wow. sort of three periods to Wes Anderson, and the first one is Bottle Rock and Rush One, up to the midpoint of the Royal Tenenbaums, Bombs, which I won't spoil in case anybody here hasn't seen it, but there's a, there's a scene in the middle of the Royal Tenenbaums Bombs where you, if you had not seen a Wes Anderson film up to that point, you're a little bit shocked that something like that would happen in a film like that. And I think from that point forward, that, The Life Aquatic, and The Dark Gene Unlimited are much darker, much more, the mix of the moods is a lot more extreme. And then he gets to Fantastic Mr. Fox and Numerous Kingdom, and I feel like he sort of force bricks a little bit. Those movies are not like Life Aquatic, Darjeeling, and even Rushmore in that uh, they're not mixing comedy and tragedy in quite such a uh, kind of keyless way. But Fantastic Mr. Fox has one mode pretty much from start to finish, and so does Numerous Kingdom. Um, so I think, if anything, he's applying the technical lessons that he learned in the early, the middle part of his career. But he seems to have been kind of returning to the earlier movies. When he, he once joked to me, after Rushmore came out, uh, it came out around the time that there were a lot of young directors releasing movies that were two and a half to three hours long. And he said, Matt, if I ever do a movie that doesn't have a nine in front of the running time, you'll know there's something wrong with me. And then the next movie he made was Royal Tenet Bombs, which, which was uh, 110 minutes or something. <laughs> But yeah, I just think he's more, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't know how to boil that down. I think he's constantly testing himself. That's a good thing. Um, we're gonna, uh, in just a few minutes from now, after we're done talking, I just wanna remind you that uh, Matt will be at a table over here and that there will be copies of the Wes Anderson collection if you'd like to obtain one and uh, he'll be happy to sign it as well. It's a, a, a wonderful resource for Wes Anderson uh, knowledge and trivia. And, great book. Um, I wanted to uh, shift up here just a moment and ask about um, RogerEbert.com and about um, film criticism online. Um, you know, it's, it, there's a, probably about only a hundred some odd uh, paid full-time film critics, now, uh, critics nowadays, I think, really working um, for papers or other, other publications online or, or print or otherwise. Um, and yet, uh, before Mr. Ebert passed away, you know, I think he was remarking about nowadays being the real golden age of film criticism because there are so many great voices out there online. You know, each of y'all being, you know, two of those great voices. What do you think about the current state of uh, film criticism today? Uh, I, uh, Ebert, Ebert was right. Uh, there is a lot of great criticism. The so-called democratization of the internet has allowed for a lot of great criticism of uh, blogs, movie sites, and so forth. But it's also uh, allowed for a lot of bad criticism. But I think it's also, and it's probably 
Um, and so the, t the thing is, 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 so you get this, this feeling of uh, being the contrary critic, uh, to, so you can be heard about the noise. And that's something that I, I really don't buy into, or I don't do, I try not to do. Uh, I just feel, I think it shows more skills if you are in agreement with me with a consensus and seeing your voice can be heard over the din over all the other uh, voices. And as far as the, the, you know, the pain jobs, uh, the domain of limits are not full-time jobs, I think one of the mis, uh, mis, misnomers that happened from the 60s and 70s, you know, when movie critics were kind of almost like rock stars for a while, Gail and Sarah Stinkers, Molly Haskell and so forth. And so there's an Eber and Cisco where, oh, I can be one of the rock stars. When actually, it's the line from Almost Famous, Leslie Banks tells the kid, uh, first of all, you don't get paid for but you'll get three records for record book. And that's kind of the thing I tell anyone who wants to be a critic. It's like, first of all, chances are you're not going to get one of the biggies, but you'll get to see a lot of your movies for free. So if, you get, if you're willing to be, you know, that's you know, that goes for literary criticism, rock criticism, theater criticism. If you're willing to, you know, be the life of a writer and just live that modest life, uh, it's a great, it's a great job. But if you're trying to do it as a launch pad to something else, uh, you might as well be, I think Matt used to say, you might as well be a black Yes. Yeah. So, but then, uh, criticism, I mean, and that's the thing. I try to find the critics online who, who challenge me, who challenge me in a good way, not uh, sometimes confrontational, but just have uh, uh, taken on a different, you know, take film on a different way. The problem is that right now there's a lot of things that are, I think, People are just kind of, sometimes they just kind of, you know, like sometimes come up with two different angles on any given film. But, I mean, yes, it is a goal to be criticism. I don't know how many sites or writers that I have put on that I would, I have to go and read their weekly stuff. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, they come from all stripes. I mean, uh, it's like, you know, I think it's like Jeff Bezos or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The younger generation. There's a whole, there's a group of the older critics who kind of tiss tiss the internet critics. And they all started to come in in like 2004, 2004, 2007. There are a lot of those old, old guard critics who uh, kind of tiss tiss them and said, uh, there was one, one Australian critic who said, it's a better paraphrasing, uh, well, they shouldn't be, they shouldn't do anything until they're 30. By then they'll see enough that, you know. And that's kind of bullshit, because all these guys were film fanatics when they were kids. They were practicing and learning, you know, so there, there's just this kind of, there's a precipice with them. But Ebert, uh, he didn't have that. And he didn't have that, and, and unlike some other critics who maybe try to gather followers, Ebert, he, he supported people, but he encouraged you to go on on your own. Because he knew you would come back to him. Yeah, he liked, he liked, he liked people to have different opinions and different styles and different tastes than he had. He found it exciting. And, and uh, I obviously, you know, doing the job that I do, I think about Roger every single day. And, and uh, I think about what made him a special critic. A lot of things, but the, the two things that jumped out at me, one is he wrote in very plain language. He was a beautiful writer, very intricately wrought some of his sentences, but always in very plain language it was easy to understand, even if he was explaining complicated concepts. And the other thing was, he started from the point of view of what does the movie make you feel? What does the movie make you feel? What do you feel as you're watching the movie? And how does the movie make you feel these things? What does it do in technically and narratively make you feel these things? And that's why people love Roger Ebert. That's why people love Pauline Kael. There's a, a, ver a very small handful of critics that people love. And they don't just talk about them like, gee, that's interesting. It's something deeper than that. Like they talk about it in the way they talk about friends who really mean something to them. And and one of the reasons why Roger was one of those critics is that he wrote it from the heart. And he wasn't afraid of that. He wasn't like Mr. Spock standing back and, ex and examining a soil sample when he wrote about the movies. He was right in there with you know, I think that's important. And he was fluid with his opinions. So that the one thing that the one thing that has happened in criticism last 
half dozen years or so is that it's become like rock criticism to where, you know, rock criticism for the longest time it was, I support this band uh, because what this band represents, I wanted to represent me. And so you became a, you became a, you know, lockstep, whatever, whatever that band did, that's, it represented you, you know, being you know, punk aesthetic or whatever. And so there was no room for growth or for consideration or even, hey, what if that band put out a bad album? No, that band stood for something. So, and with, and with some circles of film criticism, it's become that way with directors or with actors. You know, this director I have become, I, I, I stand by what this director represents no matter what, good or bad film. And Ebert was, he never did that. He was, he could, he could love, no, he could love Animal House, and he could love a Robert Bresson film festival equally. So they could both be both be great. And he didn't see any competition. We have another one more question. I, um, I actually answered a couple of questions that I had when I was talking about the other night um, about what can be available uh, tonight, and then also about the uh, United Kingdom, which uh, I think may have replaced uh, Russian players. Anderson movie that was really uh, one way by and really just uh, drawn into it and it is chock full of those uh, dollhouse uh, shots uh, and masterful sequences that you talked about. So uh, I'm sort of left with uh, asking you about uh, the Wes Anderson Visa commercial, uh, <laughs> which I think is a, a great example of uh, how you describe his uh, technique with uh, staging and you mean the American Express? Oh, American Express, oh, yeah. sorry, wrong credit card. But uh, yeah, if you, if you could comment about that, I'm sure you probably don't write a lot of the book, but uh, you know, it is a, a sort of a subconscious way of uh, you know, showing off uh, one of his stylistic. Uh, well, it's all one long take. It's all one long take, and, and it, it definitely shows that off. But it's also an homage to Prince Rock and Pearl's Day for Night, and uses a piece of music, which actually was Play for the movie. Um, and, uh, and it's a way of sort of sending up the idea of the director is rock star, director is Rosario. And it's really sort of beautiful how Wes is able to have it, eat his cake and have it too, and that ad. And, and it's very funny when I tell people this, um, Wes is very shy and awkward in particular ways, in particular situations. If you see the American Express ad, you find that a little hard to believe, but it's true. And in that ad, in that particular ad, he's not 